And welcome back, everybody, to the Peter Schiff Show. Tom Woods in for Peter. And very glad to be joined by, well, as it turns out, another Peter. Peter Klein is the executive director and Carl Menger Research Fellow of the Ludwig von Mises Institute and also associate professor in the Division of Applied Social Sciences at the University of Missouri, where he also directs the McQuinn Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership, and he holds a Ph.D. in economics from the University of California at Berkeley. Peter Klein, welcome to the program. Hi, Tom. Great to be here. Thanks a lot. I mean, I, there are a lot of things you and I can talk about, but the the item that I think uh, precipitated your presence here was a, a blog post you had the other day on the subject of Nelson Mandela and apartheid and capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. And what I found interesting about this post of yours is that Mandela thought of the apartheid, the racial apartheid system, as being some sort of form of capitalism. And so therefore, in order to get rid of apartheid, we're really involved in an anti-capitalist struggle. So before we get into the details of that, why don't you define for us what capitalism is so that we can better understand what is so preposterous about a, an understanding like that. That's a great, a great point, a great way to, to set up the discussion. Um, you know, the word capitalism is kind of a potentially confusing term. This was the term that was popularized by Karl Marx, a critic of the free market system. You and I, Tom, might talk about the free market or uh, an open economic system, laissez-faire, something like that. Um, you know, uh, so a, a true capitalist economy that we would support right, would be one in which there is minimal or even zero government intervention in the economic system. Uh, private property rights are secure. Uh, the government doesn't interfere with prices. There's no central direction of investment. In other words, capital markets are free, but of course, labor markets are free. Markets for land and other resources are free. In other words, what you and I would support is the free market system. People sometimes confuse that with a system in which, you know, large companies are specifically singled out for support or capital is somehow elevated above labor. And, you know, we wouldn't describe a free market system that way at all. It's, you know, a system of private voluntary interaction among all sorts of people, owners of capital, uh, owners of labor, owners of raw materials, entrepreneurs, and so on. Okay, now having said that, I think it should be easy <laughs> to explain. Yeah. Why was the apartheid system <laughs> not a capitalist system? Yeah. Well, you know, I want to back up a little bit. Um, okay. I was a college student back in the 1980s when the uh, there was this big movement, uh, especially on college campuses, but elsewhere uh, in the U.S. and Europe, to uh, divest or disinvest from companies doing business in South Africa. So this is when the plight of... Uh, South Africa sort of uh, became better known on the world stage when Nelson Mandela, still in prison at that uh, point, uh, you know, became an international celebrity. And, uh, you know, everyone wanted to do something about the apartheid system. So the South African apartheid system was a series, uh, was a system of legally mandated restrictions on what various groups in the economy could do, what various individuals in the economy could do based on their race. So there were official uh, racial classifications in the apartheid system, white, black, and what they called colored or mixed race, and Indian. And whether you could own land, uh, whether you could own certain kinds of capital, where you could live, and what kind of jobs uh, you could have were all uh, circumscribed by uh, this racial classification. So uh, everybody, uh, of course, you know, would see this as an unjust and economically inefficient system, uh, when these people began, uh, when the world took notice of this system and people began objecting to it and talking about it back in the 80s, you know, the, 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 the anti-apartheid movement was often described as sort of an anti-capitalist movement. In other words, there, uh, you know, South Africa, which has a very unique history, we can talk about that too, um, you know, is it, it, a country like many others in that part of the world where you have a small uh, very wealthy elite, mostly white, uh, controlling a lot of land and uh, most of the equity of private companies, and, and a large group of black, colored, and Indian uh, uh, individuals who have a much lower socioeconomic status. So because the white minority also was heavily involved in production and were owners of factories and so on, it was assumed that the apartheid system was not only uh, a system of racial 
a prejudice, but also a system that favored capitalism and capitalists at the expense of workers. So the black liberation movement in South Africa was conflated with some kind of worker liberation movement, you know, rights of workers and, and the disadvantaged more generally against the privilege of the capitalists and the wealthy. So what really was a legitimate protest against a statist, socialist, or in some ways you could describe it as fascist economic system, was portrayed as a fight against capitalism. Now, you've got in, in this uh, post of yours, and this is over at the Mises Institute blog, so you can check out Mises.org, and I'm, I don't mean to insult the intelligence of listeners of this program by spelling Mises, but just in case, M-I-S-E-S dot org. And, here, and you quote uh, Tom Hazlitt saying, uh, the conventional view is that apartheid was devised by affluent whites to suppress poor blacks. In fact, the system sprang from class warfare and was largely the creation of white workers struggling against both the black majority and white capitalists. And by the way, yeah. that's not obviously an uncommon situation. I mean, if you look at American labor history, it's interesting to see how progressives try to deal with, on the one hand, they love labor unions, and on the other hand, they hate racism, and they got to somehow hold both opinions at once when you look at how exclusionary labor unions typically have been, and they don't want the competition from the lower-wage blacks, so they, right. they, they try to get rid of them. They try to get the minimum wage increase to completely get them out of the labor force, which they did, of course. You can see when you correlate the minimum wage increases with black unemployment, it's just, uh, it's just exactly the same line. This is a phenomenon everywhere, and it's just, I always think it's funny to watch progressives who have such a simple view of the world that there are good guys and bad guys, and unions yeah. are good guys, and no, anti-racist people are good guys. But then what happens when you have a situation like this? They don't, then they don't know what to do or think. No, you're absolutely right, and it's very common for people to take, you know, somewhat co uh, fairly complicated social and economic issues and try to, you know, decompose them into a, make them into a very simple morality play between very broad groups, you know, labor versus capital. If you look at uh, labor economics, history of the labor movement, um, it's really all of the interesting dynamics are among different groups of labor, right? Uh, labor unions representing typically high-skilled uh, artisan uh, occupations, uh, trying to keep uh, unskilled lower-wage laborers, workers, uh, out of the labor market. And apartheid is a perfect example of that because its primary supporters, as you already mentioned, uh, were uh, members of the, the relatively affluent white labor unions in, South Af in the South African cities. There's also support from uh, uh, the rural countryside, white farmers in the rural countryside. But uh, the, uh, the goal was to minimize competition from lower-skilled black workers who were willing to work at lower wages, obviously to undercut uh, the higher wages of the white uh, labor unions. Um, capitalists, you know, business owners in South Africa were, were not, not at all supporters of the apartheid system. Right? If you own a business, if you're an entrepreneur, a financier, a capitalist, you want to be able to hire, uh, you know, the most qualified workers at the lowest possible wages. Why on earth would you cut off the majority of the local labor force and be required to deal with a very small portion of the labor force to which you would have to pay higher wages? In, in no sense were the business people, the business community, the capitalist community, the strongest supporters of the apartheid regime. It was mostly uh, middle-class white labor unions. One other thing that's interesting about uh, South Africa, and as I mentioned in the blog post, it just so happens that I was doing a tour of South Africa uh, last month uh, and found out a lot of, uh, more about its fascinating history. Um, even the uh, you know the, the apartheid movement is 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 a relatively recent phenomenon uh south africa uh, was colonized by two separate european groups by british colonists and also uh, a little bit earlier by uh by, by dutch traders the descendants of the dutch uh, uh colonists what became known as afrikaners or boers a slightly derogatory term were mostly farmers mostly in the rural areas and were much more kind of um, uh, uh, nativist or uh, likely to uh, oppose mixing among the different racial groups and ethnic groups in South Africa than the, mo the, the, mo than the English speaking uh, descendants of the British colonists. So there's always this struggle between the British and the Dutch. You know, the Anglo Boer War of the late 19th century was 
because uh, it's completely unknown to most uh, American students or the American public or whatever, was a group, was a war between two different white colonial interests. And the, uh, uh, the apartheid movement, which was uh, instituted by the Afrikaner National Party, uh, this only happened in, uh, after World War II. It was 1948 that the Afrikaner Party came to, pa- came to power. It's been argued by uh, W.H. Hutt, and other classical liberal scholars that the uh, British, uh, uh, the, the, the British settlers uh, in South Africa and the South African sort of national polity when it was part of the British crown was much more classically liberal. Uh, that there was a movement to institute more security for property rights, um, more kind of uh, you know uh, emphasis on the rule of law. Uh, and not a kind of centrally planned economic system. The centrally planned economic system with government control, not only of labor, but also of investment, was a relatively recent post-World War II socialist phenomena. So the white nationalist Afrikaner government, widely understood in the West to be only about racial issues, you know, combined uh, a belief in uh, racial segregation with a socialist economic system. And that's what, uh, what makes this story so interesting and complicated, is that some of the resistance to the apartheid regime was based on, uh, you know, desire to uh, eliminate the racial barriers, but a lot of it was also a fight against socialism and an attempt to have a more decentralized system and something closer to a free market system. Peter Klein, uh, stand by, if you will, for just a few minutes uh, when we go to this break. Uh, When we come back, I want to shift gears a bit and talk a little bit about where the Austrian school is today. I mean, you are in a position of influence, of course, uh, within the school, and obviously uh, you have an important role at the Mises Institute. Where do you see it going? I mean, are we stagnating? Are we growing? Do we need the Ron Paul presidential campaigns to keep this thing going? So let's talk about uh, future directions of the Austrian school coming up next on The Peter Schiff Show. To fix the car, no humble man 